Hi. Hi, everybody. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so as um, we were mentioning, uh, my name is Summer Kirtley. I'm the clinical nurse specialist. I previously had been working with the NICU and newborn departments in the women and infant area, as well as pediatrics for the organization. And I'm actually uh, very pleased that I'm actually going to be changing my role a little and getting to be just a full-time pediatric CNS. So I'm actually looking forward to it. So um, hopefully I can get a little bit more involved in some of the areas that are seeing pediatric patients and um, help with some of the things that we've identified as some concerns that we want to improve upon. So um, I'm excited to be here today for you guys to kind of meeting some of you guys for the first time uh, for um, your trauma day away. And so I'm going to be reviewing a little bit about pediatrics and uh, some basics related to that. So um, some of the objectives that we're going to review during this lecture. Uh, which we'll do about 20, or 20 to 30 minutes or so of lecture, and then we're going to do some hands-on and actually get to play with some of the items that we use for pediatric patients. Uh, we don't always have a lot of time to do that in the past, so I want to make sure that you get some good time and quality time to actually really go through the equipment, because I think getting familiar with the equipment is really important. So some of the objectives we're going to try to meet today is we want to describe appropriate methods for taking and monitoring pediatric vital signs. When I identify normal variations for pediatric vital signs, we're going to recognize when a code blue pediatric should be called or would be called, uh, describe how to call it, um, identify where the equipment that is needed for a code for uh, code blue pediatrics will be, uh, describe the purpose of a Brazel or aka a pediatric crash cart, and we're going to describe the organization of that Brazlow cart and Brazlow system. We're going to discuss a little bit about how to use the Brazlow tape on a pediatric patient and how to identify the color on admission um, for the Brazil color as well as how to find appropriate pediatric equipment and sizes that you're needing. And we're going to also talk a little bit about when discharging a patient some of the rules for car seats and car seat laws uh, for the forms and things that are required for that. So we'll kind of get started. So first thing we're going to kind of talk about is pediatric vital signs. So uh, we always take vital signs on a, in adults, that's nothing new to anybody. Um, many people have taken um, vital signs on pediatric patients, maybe it was a while for you, maybe it was in nursing school, maybe it was yesterday. Either way, we're going to just kind of review the very, very basics for you guys to make sure that you kind of understand some of the variations with the different age ranges. So I was able to give you guys a handout, so um, it has the vital signs for a normal ranges for a pediatric patient. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't have any of these memorized. Many people do not. That's why we give it as a resource. Uh, it's a lot of information and a lot of different age ranges have variations. So um, it's not something that we memorize the same as we do with most of our adult values. So I'm hoping this will be kind of a resource for you guys as well. Uh, these are the vital signs recommended after the most recent PALS update, so they do match uh, the most recent recommendations for vital signs. So we're going to talk about each one of them a little bit in detail. So we're going to talk about the heart rate and how that essentially can vary in the way we assess a patient that's pediatrics for a heart rate. So some of the things that you do for assessing a heart rate is similar to your adult population. Uh, one thing that you'll kind of note that we tend to do for a pediatric patient is we are doing more auscultation to actually get our rates and rhythm. We have to for the rhythm, but for the rate, uh, we'll tend to do more auscultation in a pediatric population versus just doing a pulse check. Uh, so there are some variations um, in the heart rate for a pediatric patient that aren't always caught necessarily by um, just essentially doing a pulse. So we usually do try to listen to get a rate and a rhythm for a pediatric patient. So uh, a lot of people ask me questions about, well, where exactly do I listen on a pediatric patient with a smaller, smaller diameter and smaller chest in comparison to adult? And it's actually very, very similar. It's not really any um, different in the locations that you tend to listen. The only difference is as the child gets a little bit closer to school age, from infancy to school age, they do do a little bit of a rotation with the heart that essentially aligns a little bit more to what you're used to for the heart valves and where you listen for an adult population. So a little bit younger than school age, um, a little times you'll kind of have, um, and you can see it here on your uh, lower left sternal border, you'll have a little bit more on the left -er side of the patient, or excuse me, right side of the patient a little bit more than essentially uh, your adult sometimes. But honestly, if you were listening in the exact same locations that you do for your adults on a smaller chest, you're still gonna be able to hear all the same heart valve sounds that you would normally on a pediatric patient or a newborn even, okay? So as you can see, uh, the heart rates for the child um, do vary by their size and age. Most of the time the neonates will have a higher heart rate um, essentially as they are born and then essentially start to get closer and closer and closer 
to your adult, adult normal values that you're kind of used to as they age. So usually that newborn is gonna have a lot higher of a heart rate than you're probably used to with your adult populations. So it does give a variation, and what I really actually like about this new set of vitals that um, PALS had come out with is that it does give an awake, um, pretty much a, a norm, uh, norm for being awake versus a resting heart rate. So just like our adult population, if they are awake, alert, agitated, or in pain, et cetera, their vital signs are gonna increase. Pediatric patients are the same way. As they're crying or they're mad that you're doing a set of vital signs on them, their heart rate's gonna be a little more elevated than essentially if they were quiet, calm, resting, or sleeping. So I do like that it kind of gives a range for both of those, so you can kind of have an idea of what is con considered normal for the variation. Uh, so you will notice that they do change and they get closer to the adult values um, as they start to age or get towards the adolescent age range. One other thing is really important is heart rates are variable in pediatric patients. They're variable in adults also, so that's very uh, similar to what you're used to with adult population but they definitely will vary based off of activity. So um, depending on what the child is doing, again, like we talked about, whether they're crying and screaming or whether they're resting, you'll have a lot more variability in, for that spectrum or that range. Um, the next thing I was gonna talk about is pulses. So some of the pulses that we do on a pediatric patient is a little bit different. Um, oh, what, actually, I apologize, I'm actually gonna go back. Heart rate, one other thing I wanted to point out to you is where you would put the monitor leads. So many times for the babies or for kids or smaller kids, uh, you don't always have the same surface area on a chest that you would for your adult population. So I think it's important to kind of bring up what you would do for being able to use the chest that you have on a smaller patient and where you would put your leads for that. So uh, there are some that we use for some of the areas that have uh, brand new babies and infants that they do have sticky leads that are very similar to the adult population that they're sticky, but they're um, actually separate to a cord and they can actually plug in specifically for a newborn. Uh, this is actually really good for a child that's probably less than a month old or some of our preemie babies. Um, so that it's a lot smaller and it's actually a good way to get a good reading for such a small diameter for a chest. So I'm actually gonna um, pass this around so you guys can kind of see that also. So you can kind of take a peek at it. Okay, so the other ones for your heart rate leads. Um, also you will have essentially these, which I'm sure you guys are kind of familiar with. These are kind of what you've seen for your adult population. They're the snap-on type leads. Uh, these are actually, they originally had pediatric sizes and ironically, as things have gotten better with technology, the adult sizes have gotten smaller for the size of these and the pediatric populations actually stay the same. So now the ones that most everybody is using for the adult is actually the smallest size that we have for pediatric patients other than the, the neonatal size. So we still do use these even on like a one year old or a two year old, we still will use the same sizes that you guys are using. Uh, you'll notice there are three leads for these instead of five leads. So it's the same idea of white is right and then smoke over fire. Uh, when it's a three lead, the red and the green are interchangeable, if that makes sense for you. So they're interchangeable, they are essentially the same. So you don't always have to have a five lead EKG to essentially get the, what you're needing for that. Any questions about heart rate so far? Okay. Okay, uh, so the next thing, sorry, I jumped ahead uh, earlier, is our pulses. So we do do pulses on all of our uh, infants and pediatric patients as well, obviously. Uh, so there are a couple of variations in locations of where we do occasionally get those pulses. So one of the biggest ones actually is for our babies. We actually do a brachial. I think for infants, it's really the only time that you tend to ever get a brachial pulse. Um, as they age, it's not necessarily the best location to get that type of a pulse. But for any child that's less than one year of age, the most accurate assessment of a pulse is going to be brachial. Um, another thing that you'll notice, as many of the children are small, especially if they're school age or younger, so around five or less, uh, they're not gonna have the most established pedal pulses or even radial pulses. So a lot of times you are gonna probably be wanting to look for either brachial, carotid, or femoral. I actually really like femoral. I think it's a quick and fast and easier way to probably get a pulse on a child than almost any other, uh, any other option. So there are some varying options on the ways that you can get them, but definitely if they're less than a year, the most accurate is to do a brachial pulse, okay? Okay, so respiratory rate. Um, so essentially when we're assessing the respiratory rate for a child or an infant, um, 
contrary to what we do with adults, which a lot of times is actually looking at the chest, seeing how many times they breathe, um, ch children are a little bit different. They do vary in their in their inhalations and they don't always breathe on command the same way that we kind of do. And some of them are abdominal breathers, so it's actually really difficult to just watch and see what their respiratory rate is unless they're an older pediatric child of like 12 or 15 years old. Uh, so what we actually do recommend for that as well is to auscultate to be able to listen for a respiratory rate. Um, as well as for your rhythm, but essentially more listening for your rate to make sure that you get an accurate assessment of that. So um, it is very difficult to count for both the heart rate and a respiratory rate if you have a small child and their heart rate is 150, 200. That's very challenging to sit and count that for a full minute. We realize that. So there is some tricks that you can do of actually just doing it for only 30 seconds and then doubling it or even 15 seconds and then timesing it by four. What I want to caution you with that is that you still want to make sure that you're listening for that rate or that rhythm for a full minute because you still want to make sure that you didn't just get that 15 second snapshot of time and really the rhythm is abnormal when you're listening to it for a longer period of time for both respiratory sounds as well as a, a heart rate rhythm as well. So it is difficult to count one and two and three and listening to the whole thing and trying to count to 200. It's near impossible. You'll lose count, I promise. So um, for your respiratory rates, they uh, do vary, but they mostly kind of sit um, in the infant age range between anywhere from 30 to 50 is kind of the generalization of range when they're first born or really small. And as again, they get older towards uh, teenager age, they start to get closer to more of an adult type of rate for the respiratory rate. Uh, a couple other things that are common for pediatric patients, they show their respiratory stress, distress a little bit differently than sometimes an adult. So a very common thing that you'll see is retractions on a pediatric patient. So what retractions are is when they're working really hard with all those accessory muscles to take good, big, deep breaths, uh, they are working a lot more of their muscles. So I actually put a picture here for you to also see where some of the most common places for retractions are between the ribs, under the ribs, over the top by the clavicles, etc. So there's a lot of variation with what you'll see with retractions for kids. Retractions are not considered normal in a pediatric patient or an infant. That is a sign of respiratory distress. They also do other things such as nasal flaring. They definitely will have grunting, um, which is very common in a baby. Grunting is essentially trying to provide a open positive pressure airway, so they're kind of trying to compensate. Again, that's not a normal sign. That usually means there's some type of a blockage. And if you're hearing strider, it's a lot more of that upper airway, which um, I'm thinking you guys are familiar with some of your patients seeing that already. Okay, um, so respiratory, again, the best way is to actually listen. Let's talk blood pressures. So assessments of a blood pressures. I actually think, um, I make the joke, you always get pediatric vital signs whenever you can get pediatric vital signs because a child does not sit still and take commands like some of our adult patients can. So you gotta sneak them in whenever you can. And the blood pressure is no different. I feel like it's something I either start my assessment with or I end it with putting it on and coming back when the child is a little bit calmer or rested and trying to sneak a blood pressure. You ideally want to get a blood pressure when a child is calm. Again, that's very challenging. So sometimes even just putting the blood pressure cuff on the child and giving it some time and coming back is another option to do that. So uh, where, how do we essentially uh, do that for where we take the blood pressures? Um, the only variation really is with our infants. So if it's a child less than a year, you actually can do it on the calf. So I'll um, show you our baby here. You can use it on the calf to be able to get a blood pressure for a child that's less than a year. Um, sometimes as they start to get older, even the big chunkier one-year-olds, you definitely can start moving towards doing it on an arm. There's no problems with that, but a lot of times the babies, your most accurate um, blood pressure is gonna come from doing it on the calf. So there's a lot of variation in the blood pressure sizes. Most of them um, are essentially, they have one through five, which is the neonatal versions, the very, very, very small um, ones. Once you start getting to four and five, you're into a term baby's size blood pressure cuff. It then goes up to a, uh, there's a pediatric version, and then there's also a small adult version. So you can start moving into the pediatric and the small adults, probably in school age, around four and five, and then they're getting up to the small adult when they start getting to teenager age, depending on their size, okay? Uh, blood pressure ranges, they definitely have a lot of variation for their blood pressures, a lot more, I think, than the adult population does. 
uh, which again is why I don't even have this chart memorized. It can be a challenge to remember all of what systolic versus diastolic um, are by heart or by memory. But what really we look at a lot of times in the pediatric population is that mean. So we really do look at the mean of a blood pressure. I don't remember doing a whole lot of looking at the means when I was working with adult populations. But with the pediatric population, the mean actually says a lot about what the child is doing and essentially where the child's um, blood pressure is remaining stable or not. So um, the one thing we worry about the most in almost all pediatric resuscitations or complications is a lot of dehydration and especially leading towards hypotension. Hypotension is more of a concern with our pediatric, patient, pediatric population uh, in comparison to the adult population, which do have a lot of hypertension. We don't have a whole lot of hypertension in the pediatric population, although we are starting to see it more in our obesity, uh, childhood obesity complex um, situations. But most of the children are gonna have a hypotensive state. So we're more worried about whether the child is getting hypotensive, dehydrated, low blood, sh or, uh, low blood volume, et cetera, is more of one of our concerns uh, for the pediatric population, especially related to resuscitation. So for the pulse ox for a child, um, you can actually do a pulse ox just similar to the way that you do for adults. So you do have the ones that you can use for finger clips. However, trying to put a finger clip on to a baby or a one-year-old or even sometimes those toddlers, it's not gonna stay on for very long, right? Uh, first thing they're gonna do is try to take that off, throw it off um, and get rid of it. So um, for the babies, there is another option. It's kind of like a Band-Aid type option, which I'm um, wondering if you guys have seen before. But essentially, it can go around the foot, it can also go around the hand, and it can also go around the big toe. And so the way that this one works, I should take it off here for my baby. The way this one actually works is it has two sensors, one on the top and one here, and essentially it's no different than the red light that comes through your clip. You just want to make sure that the top light and the bottom light are one on top of the other, and then it can read. So essentially, if I wanted to do it on the wrist, if I was to pair it around the wrist where one light is on one side and the other light is on the other, it would be a good way to read it. Same is true with doing the same on the foot as well. So those are some other options for ways to get a uh, pulse ox on a baby. Um, I think it works really well, especially for the younger kids because they're less likely to rip it off or pull it off, especially if you put it on their toe or on their foot. Uh, if they're laying in bed, they're mostly uh, not really frustrated with the fact that it's there. Um, sometimes kicking a little, but most of the time the foot is an easier way. If it's on their hands and they're older, they're just going to want to rip the darn thing right off. So sometimes that's nice to have it on the foot. Just be mindful if they do get up to go walk, because they are pretty vibrant kiddos usually um, in some occasions, and you don't want them to trip on the cord because they're not going to be mindful of whether or not they have something to attach to them like an adult population might be. Okay, I'm going to pass this around for you guys to take a look at. Do you? Good. Do you use them a lot on your adult population too? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so you're old pros. I don't even need to go into that then. All right, so uh, for temperatures for the babies um, and kids, essentially there are multiple options of ways to do temperature. We can do axillary, rectal, and oral. Um, most of the time, many of your children are not going to want oral or take oral until they're usually school age. So. Once they're around five or six or in school and taking direction, then they'll kind of hold a thermometer in their mouth. The rest of the time, your essentially options are axillary or rectal. Um, what I really also like about this chart is that it does give you essentially um, the temperature approximations of what a normal would be depending on the routes that you're taking it. Um, it's not as simple with the adult population as it's always between this and this and it's normal. Um, it does vary depending on the way you're taking the temperature. Uh, and it kind of gives a little bit of a guideline as well for when we should do um, which and essentially which is the most accurate. So a lot of times we actually try to use axillaries because it's less invasive, but once we get an abnormal axillary, that's when we start wanting to look a little bit more invasively and seeing if we should do a rectal temperature or starting to go towards other options. Uh, there's been a lot of temperatures using uh, tim tympanic or um, also the ones on the forehead temporal. Um, both of those have their complications. If you don't do them just right, they don't really read um, all that well. So it's definitely been a struggle. Definitely the most accurate way to get a core temperature is still rectal and even transesophageal. Okay. Any questions about vital signs? Okay. Pretty basic. Just want to make sure I covered the basics for you guys, but I think you're probably all way more knowledgeable about um, vital signs that we can probably skip through most. So pediatric resuscitation. So the uh, next things I kind of wanted to talk about is clarifying a little bit more about some of our codes here at UCSD. 
So uh, some of the codes that are able to be called that might affect some of your areas or at least the pediatric population is our adult code blues. They can be called. I know that uh, you guys don't call codes in your areas, but I just want to make sure that there's some clarity about what each of those mean and who essentially is responders for those so that it kind of just provides some clarity for you guys. So at UCSD, we actually do recognize that any child that is less than 14 years of age is a pediatric patient. So any patient that is 14 years older, 14 years of age or older is considered an adult in our hospital. So they are able to be on an adult floor in other areas if they are essentially greater than 14 years of age. So that's kind of UCSD's definition. That's very common actually in a hospital that doesn't actually have a pediatric unit or area that there will be a particular age cutoff at those facilities where they do essentially treat some of those teenager ages on the regular adult size floors. Uh, so there's the adult code blue, which you're very familiar with what that is, but you do get an adult code blue team with that response. Uh, what's different about code, code blue pediatrics is it's for a pediatric patient. So the team that actually does come is a PALS certified trained team. This is a team from the ED. So the emergency department is the main responder for a pediatric code blue. We know there's a lot of other areas, yours including, where you have PALS trained people. You're not required by any means to call a pediatric code blue, especially in areas that are capable of running their own codes, which many of the units that do see peds are. But if you ever had additional support and needs, uh, you can always call it to get extra help, extra backup, extra equipment, extra people to provide any additional support that you might need for the pediatric population. So um, that one is, again, specific to a pediatric population. So it's any child less than 14 years of age. That does go all the way down to the size of an infant. Um, so I do want to provide a little bit of clarity between that and what's considered our code pink. So code pink is essentially a maternal emergency, a baby that's recently delivered or delivering. Um, it's also a maternal hemorrhage of a mom that has recently gone through the birth process. And so any infant that essentially needs resuscitation related to the birth process is when we would do a code pink. A code blue pediatric is intended for more of an infant that is not within the women and infant area or is not post right after birth. So any infant that was essentially discharged out of the women and infant facility and essentially was being readmitted would essentially fall into this code blue pediatric um, realm. So for example, if we had a baby that went home from the woman that was born, went home from the women and infant area, now had a blue dusky spell and is now becoming a readmit coming in through the ED via an ambulance, that would be a pediatric code blue because it's coming in after it was born in a sense. Okay, does that kind of clarify that a little bit? Okay, there has been confusion in the past, so I just want to help provide some clarity for people. Um, I also want to put a reminder out there that any code blue button on a wall, it does uh, call an adult code blue. That is an adult code blue team that will respond. So there is no pediatric code blue buttons on any wall. So if you need to call a pediatric code blue, we would do that by calling telecom. And how do we tell call telecom? 6111, everybody knows that one. So uh, one thing to also mention is that you want to say the full verbiage of code blue pediatric. You don't want to just say code blue peds because it has been mixed up in the past for code pink. So we do want to make sure you use the full verbiage of code blue pediatric so that it's really clear to who's supposed to be coming and the team, okay? So uh, Brazzle Cart. So let's talk a little bit more about the Brazzle Cart itself and kind of a little bit about the purpose of the cart. Whoop. I just took my um, pocket. Sorry about that. Uh, so the Brazil cart it is a crash cart. It is intended for that pediatric population. So anyone from a newborn all the way up until they essentially size out of the Brazil cart, which is approximately getting closer to teenager age, uh, is when you would want to use a pediatric uh, Brazil cart. So the Brazil cart, it's not just a color-coded cart, which we'll talk about its purpose a little bit, but it's not just a cart, it's actually an organizational system. It's a system designed by Mr. Brazel himself, where essentially they wanted to be able to have an option for when these critical cases are coming into your guys' area. No one knows how old the child is. No one knows the weight of the child. No one knows any of that information. How do we provide medications and use equipment that's appropriate for that child without uh, having to do a lot of work or guess or even trying to weigh a child in an emergency and a disaster we realize is probably not a feasible option. 
So that being said, this is a quick down and dirty, fast and easy way to get an approximation of their weight and what equipment sizes they're gonna need so that we can provide care right away. Okay, so it's not delayed. So again, it is a pediatric size and weight um, uh, approximation. The way to do that is essentially taking a Braslow tape. The Braslow tape, it is a measurement device. So it is similar to doing a length, but it's fo uh, focused bo basically on the color. So you would put the head at the red piece of where the Braslow tape is, place it down, on the ch um, down by the child's head, measure to where the child's heel lands, and wherever the child's heel lands, you would then associate it with that particular color. Okay. It also actually has weights. I know it's a little bit harder for you guys to see, but I will pass it around for you. When we do some hands on time, you'll see also. Uh, wherever their heel lands, there's also the approximated weight along the bottom. So for example, if my child landed here, that would be at 22 kilos. So we would be able to um, get essentially approximated weight just by doing that, which is really kind of nice. That's a, a fast, dirty, easy way to do that. So. Um, it also has on one side of it, it will have the equipment, all the equipment sizes that are needed for that child. And also it'll have the medication doses already done for you. Because I don't know about you guys, but in a stressful situation, math is hard to do. So if you're already thinking a million things and you're stressed, <coughs> the last thing you want to do is do a medication calculation for a pediatric patient, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a way uh, to get that information pretty re readily available for you. <coughs> so how many of you have actually used the Brazo tape before? Okay, good. A lot of you, actually. Okay, good. Okay, any questions about how to actually use the tape? If they're right in the middle, they're going to go on fire or lower. Ah, good question. So I get that question quite a bit, and I also get the question about what do I do about obesity. So let's kind of talk about those real quick, and then we'll move forward also. So what do we do if, essentially, they land right in the middle? So when we have a child that lands right in the middle, usually the equipment size, usually you wanna go to the size that's on, you wanna go down one is kind of the way I say that. Because even if they're right in the middle, equipment sizes, if I use that ET tube that's a little too large, or essentially I'm trying to use a chest tube size that is a little larger than I'd like, I'm more likely to have too large of equipment and potentially cause more risk or damage than I would if I was to go a hair smaller and know maybe I'm gonna have a little bit more of an air leak, et cetera. So a lot of times if they run right in the middle, we'll kind of say that it's best for equipment sizes to just go down a color if they're right, literally dead in the center, okay? That's kind of the recommendation because of that equipment reason. So let's talk about medications though. For obesity, we are seeing a lot more childhood obesity. And if you did have a child that's maybe approximately eight years old, you do the length, but they look very large and habitus. They're a very large child. Uh, they look a little bit more like they're the size of a 14-year-old when in reality they're truly like eight. Uh, you can actually use the medication only up on one color up. So if I measure that child out to be blue and essentially they are really obese, I can go up one color for their medications only. We don't do that for the equipment sizes because anatomically their child, that child is still having the same anatomical landmarks for all equipment for the smaller size. But you can go up for the dosages for the medications because they will essentially um, bio, um, um, you know what I'm trying to say. They basically will uh, use their medications differently in their body when it's a little bit larger than essentially um, the way they would if they were the average size child. Okay. Okay. Um, so again, red to head, you can kind of see that you'll use the red on the head. I like to say heel to color. It's wherever their heel lands is the color and the weight. So red to head, heel to color is kind of how I say that. Um, okay, I think we um, kind of actually just covered all of this um, in some of that discussion as well. And Okay, so again, the Braswell tape does give an approximation of the weight. And on one side of it does have the equipment. On the other side, it does have all of the medications as well. So um, I think that's really nice and convenient. On the other side of your guys' handout that I did give you, I did give you a Braslow chart. This Braslow chart is not meant to replace this by any means. The Braslow tape is your gold standard whenever you're needing to do the, uh, any type of a measurement for the child. But um, essentially, this is a nice useful tool in case you just needed to add a Foley. You don't want to open up a crash cart to actually get the tape out to do that measurement, right? So trying to understand whether you need an NG tube size or a Foley size and you just need to go get equipment, it's kind of a nice resource to have. 
Um, so the Brazzle cart itself, I am going to have us all kind of get in there and play a little bit with the actual cart, but it's a module space system, and that I think is somewhat helpful because instead of just having tons of random items in each drawer, there's a way that they actually categorize them into each individual module based off of action. So if I measured out my child with the Brazzle tape to be blue, essentially I could go and open up the blue drawer and be able to find the modules that I'm looking for for that patient to have the equipment sizes that I need. Now, that being said, it doesn't have 100% of everything in each colored drawer. We will talk about what the variations are inside the cart, but most of the things that are in the blue drawer are size specific to that child. Some of the things that are outside of the drawers are something that can be utilized on many different children, no matter what their size is. Does that kind of make some sense? So um, we'll talk about it when we get in some hands-on in here about what is kind of in some of those other areas as well. So the oxygen delivery module is one of the options. It also has an intubation module. It has an IV module and an IO module. What's really nice about the module feature is if you are in the middle of a kind of coding scenario, you can pass off that module to, hey, RT, here's your oxygen delivery module. Here, provider, you're gonna intubate. Here's your intubation module. Uh, hey, can you help me start an IV? Here's your IV module. Oh, we didn't get the IV. Where's that IO module when we really need it? So it's a way to kind of pass off task also and give them the equipment that they're kind of needing. So I think that that's a beneficial um, way to kind of do it. There are extras of things inside each colored drawer because I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily trust that there's only one ET tube because that'll be the time you accidentally drop it on the floor. So there are some extra, um, some of those items as well in case you needed a backup, okay? Um, with the way the cart is organized, the medications are on the top. So the very top drawer will have your medications as well as your Brazo tape. So it's always gonna be on the top drawer. I always think of top as the most important. Grab your tape when your meds are there. So it's kind of the fast and easy down and dirty way to get the most important items that you need. It also has uh, some of the laryngoscopes, handles and blades are all on the top drawer. Um, they all live in the same place because there's many times when a provider will order essentially a Mac or a Miller or a size one or a size zero. They'll kind of give some variation depending on the situation that you're dealing with. And because of that, we didn't want people to have to start fumbling through a bunch of colors to try to find where that might be. So they all live at the top. So anytime you're looking for a laryngoscope handle or blade, they're right at the top for you to grab and get the one you're needing. Okay. Um, some of the other air, airway equipment is on the bottom. That's your bag and mask. So your bags and masks are rather large in size, so they're big. So always think big drawer because they're going to be bigger. So they end up in that bottom drawer. And the bottom drawer also carries, it's kind of like the catch-all drawer. If there's something that you're missing and you're not seeing it in your color-coded drawer, more than likely it's at the bottom. And some of the things that are at the bottom are less priority. So they're maybe not a priority at that time you're needing to put in a Foley. Um, maybe you might need a chest tube urgently, but many of those things are things that you're not going to need right in a resuscitation. They're essentially going to be something that you might be also needing to do also. So it's not as critical, and that's kind of another way that I look at it. It's, if it's at the bottom, it's a, maybe a lesser priority. Okay. Um, I think some hands-on really helps solidify what's actually in the cart. One of the biggest things I've seen when we've done some mock codes and people getting familiar is kind of not feeling very confident or familiar with what's in the cart. So I think getting to play with it actually does help people make them feel a little bit more um, comfortable being able to know where they're gonna go exactly to find that item. So uh, there are a couple of Braslow bags or go bags for pediatrics that are across the facility. There is one for the burn unit. Um, actually, this was something that they started to, they created, they wanted to bring in case they did have to come to an emergency to trauma for you guys. So that was something that they essentially um, uh, have as well. And it's color coded, very similar to the cart itself with the same modules in each of the individual colored pouches. The ED also has a pediatric go bag that they're rolling out uh, this end, uh, beginning of next month as well that is the same system so that if they do have to run to a code in the cafeteria or the lobby, et cetera, they would also have the equipment that they're needing in an emergency situation wherever they are. So there are a couple of these bags that have the same ideology for Brazo carts um, in the facility as well. <coughs> okay, defibrillator pads. So. There are different sizes for defibrillator pads. So the defibrillator pads that we use for the pediatric population <coughs> is this type of a version. I'm gonna pass it around so you can also see it. Uh, this version is essentially good for any child that is zero to eight years of age. 
So it's good for the zero to eight years of age. It also gives a weight, so it does go into uh, the weight and essentially it's 25 kilos is the weight that they say once they get past that, we're starting to reach towards our adult pads. So I think that's a good teaching point because people automatically assume these pads are good for all ages and all weights for pediatric patients, when in reality it's only until 25 kilos or eight years of age. So it's just something to kind of keep in mind that you might be needing your adult um, pads if it's an older child. Okay, so uh, where do we place these pads? It is a little bit different than what we do in our adult population. Your adult population has a puck and essentially you kind of put them on the front of the chest. For a pediatric population, you have one for the front. It has a face on it, goes right in the front or the chest of the child. The other one that has no face on it goes on the back. So essentially it goes onto the back of the child. So one on the front, one on the back. So this is good for every single age for our pediatric patients, including our very teeny tiny neonate population for the, N, uh, the NICU. Unfortunately, this is the only size pads that are currently being utilized. They are coming out with something soon, I'm told on the market, that FDA is approving for a much smaller pad for a preemie baby. But at this time, this is the only size for pediatric patients, regardless of if they're a small baby or that full eight-year-old. So I'm gonna pass these around so you guys can see them. Um, and you do have your adult pads available to you on your adult crash carts also. Okay, so again, front and back for where the pads are placed. So um, a couple of things that the other, a couple of the other units have been doing, which we actually think is uh, some good practice and something we're going to try to instill a little bit more as our process or across the house is uh, there's a pediatric drug sheet that can be utilized and hanging at the bedside for a known weight of a child whenever we have it. So for example, in the burn unit, they have um, a drug sheet that we're able to put in the weight of the child when it's a known weight. It's an Excel spreadsheet. All they have to do is hit enter and it gives all of the emergency uh, medications at the dosages that are appropriate for a known weight for that child. So what's nice about the Brazo tape is that you can get a fast weight quickly when you don't have a known weight. But when you do have an actual known weight, it's ideal to give the drugs based off of the known weight whenever possible. But again, just like uh, most people in a situation where they're kind of doing a code, try to do the pediatric math for those calculations <coughs> in a coding scenario is the last time you want to be doing that. So having a sheet at the bedside that already has the weight of the patient entered in and giving you all of the doses that you need for those medications is super helpful. Even if you never end up using it, it's comforting to know it's there and taped at the head of your bed if you needed it. So the NICU has been doing this as well as the burn unit and we're trying to instill other areas that might benefit from this process also. Uh, one of the things for your guys' area that we've kind of talked about in passing is essentially that most of the time you guys don't have a lot of known weights when they're coming through trauma, which is why it hasn't been a huge focus for your area yet. Uh, but it's something that if we did have a known weight or they were staying in your area a while, it would be comforting to have this um, potentially available to you as another option if you already have weighed the child. So we're going to be working with pharmacy and essentially providing some options for maybe having this available to you as needed. So I'm going to go ahead and pass that around as well so you guys can see that. Okay, so occasionally we do have some pediatric patients that are discharged from your area, um, and so I wanted to just briefly talk about uh, car seats more specifically, because any child that is uh, technically admitted to the organization that is less than eight years of age should actually have a car seat form signed on discharge that the family has acknowledged that they are required to put their child into a car seat. So why is this important? Um, there are some liability risks if essentially a family never signed a form that they were essentially supposed to have their child into a car seat. No one told them, no one educated them their child was supposed to be in a car seat. They leave here, the baby dies in a car accident and they could potentially sue us and say, well, you never told me I was supposed to have my child in a car seat. Now, I think that's kind of silly because now in today's day and age, I feel like that's very common knowledge, but nonetheless, it's one of those risks and liabilities that we try to minimize. So any child that is less than eight years of age or technically the height is four inches, or excuse me, four feet, nine inches, that would be pretty small, <laughs> yeah, pretty tidy, uh, four feet, nine inches 
if they're young, if they're smaller than that, then essentially they're also supposed to be in a car seat. No one memorizes that number per se, but eight years is appropriate. What are you two tidy? <laughs> I'm just I'm teasing some chuckles over there. Uh, so yeah, if a, if a child is supposed to essentially, uh, if they're less than eight years of age, we should ideally be having a car seat law form signed. So um, we do have we do have the forms available. They are a duplicate. So the duplicate form is one that the family is supposed to sign it and get a copy of, and then essentially the other copy goes into our record. So um, we found a lot of areas that haven't been doing this. Uh, um, the women and infant area has been doing this pretty consistently because we always have had babies, but we're starting to see in the ED and some of these other areas that we could get a lot better about doing that. So <laughs> for our child passenger safety MCP, we're supposed to be doing that. So this is why I'm just kind of bringing it up as some education to you guys. If they're less than eight years of age, we would want to have one of these signed. So I'm going to pass it around so you can also take a look at it. It also gives the information to the families because the overall goal the, of the car seat is we want to keep the kids safe, right? We want to keep them safe so that they don't get hurt in a crash. It's overall a way to help protect patient safety. Okay? What would we do? Sometimes this happens in trauma. We have to get kids in because they come in with parents. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're underage, but they don't have, they're not admitted as a patient. I guess yeah. they just write the name. Right, and then they don't bring the car seat with them sometimes. It's left in the, their, in their car. Yeah. Car. yeah. 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 Yeah, and to be quite honest, again, this law is a saying that they are planning to abide by that law. It doesn't mean that you have to physically check any child in an actual car seat. It's saying that the family acknowledges the law exists and they plan to abide by the law. So uh, we do do some check and some education when we have a baby that's brand new born because we think that the family knows nothing about car seats, which many first parents sometimes don't. So we do education in the women and infant area for that. But for the rest of the house, if you're having a pediatric patient, this is just an acknowledgement that they're planning to use a car seat. You don't have to actually have them bring in the car seat, show you the car seat, et cetera. It is a good way to do some education, but it's not a requirement for them before they go home that they have to physically bring in the car seat and show it to you. So I don't know if that helps a little bit. Part of what you were mentioning, um, again, the Sometimes we don't admit them. I mean, that they're not yeah, actually they patients, but it's somebody else, a guardian, or somebody else who can take the patient home. Right, or right. Take not the patient, take the child home. And then there was some discussions too. Um, it was actually uh, brought up, and it was actually really good. Some really good points is that I'm realizing a little bit more about how your guys' area is definitely having some unaccompanied minors, or essentially sending home minors that are going home with other family members. Um, and I think we can do a little bit of work towards looking at what the risks and what we should be doing to help minimize those risks for those type of situations and for some of those processes. So I don't think we have some firm answers on what the best way to go about some of that is yet, but I, I think it's something we need to look into to provide a better process for you guys so it's not such a big question mark when these cases come up of what to do. Um, because we're always going to get occasionally that case-by-case -case scenario that's kind of unusual, but we want to give you guys more guidance of what to do when they do come in with a family member or they're not technically a patient, but they came in because they're with a family member and now someone is going to take them home. I, I think giving you guys a little more guidance about what to do is something we should, could evaluate that process a little bit better for you. So um, the only other thing about car seats, sorry, was there another question? Uh, the only other thing I was going to mention about car seats is the new law actually has come out that the child is required to remain rear facing until two years of age. So that is something that is recommended by American Academy of Pediatrics. It's the best way to minimize any head and neck injury by having them rear facing in a car uh, if they were to get into a car accident. So um, it's just something to also kind of keep in mind or to kind of educate families if you have that knowledge. So. Essentially, any child that's two less than two years of age, they should be rear facing and in the back seat. Okay. Yeah. So if you if they you know they don't have a car seat and they're going home, you, they just sign this form and that covers us for it covers the liability. Ideally, we'd still want to. What's ideal is obviously we want them to be going home in a safe environment, right? So ideally we would like them to have the car seat. It's not your responsibility to okay. prove they have this car seat before they leave. Okay. I'm but afraid if they told you they don't have it, they didn't, so you know they don't have it, and you still send them home, are they going to come back and, if they get in a wreck on their way home, are they going to come back and, am I liable for uh, you wouldn't be liable if they've signed the form. That's the purpose of the, the releasing the liability that they are responsible, not us, not you. 
Um, but obviously it is preferred that they're bringing in the car seats for these fan the, the patient. Even if they don't bring it into your unit, at least if they brought it with them. Uh, there are sometimes people ask me, what do we do about car seats that the family can't afford a car seat? Uh, in the policy, actually, there are some places and ways, and social work can get involved as well, because there are some free car seats, a very limited number, but there are free car seats that we can give families that don't have availability to a car seat if they didn't couldn't purchase one. Uh, there are some times that we've done a, a couple of loaner car seats to get them home, and especially in an emergency situation, which a lot of your families are coming in as. There are occasional uh, loaner car seats that can also be used for that purpose temporarily, usually meant with them to return them. They don't always return them. That's kind of the challenge. And then a lot of times we can say to them, do you have one that you can borrow from your friend, your neighbor, your cousin, or whoever that might also be able to at least let them borrow one to get the child home. So the goal is obviously infant safety and pediatric safety. We want to keep these kids safe whenever possible. But it's not your responsibility to make sure that every family has a car seat uh, and that they're okay with that. But we can do what we can to help the families that don't have the resources. So attached to the car seat policy, which is child passenger safety policy, there are some um, car seat programs as well. It's also on the, the D form that comes with this um, car seat law. And it actually is about being able to have the families check their car seat, and it also talks about families that can't afford car seats and kind of some um, ways to get free car seats. So it's also a handout that we can give to the families as well. Okay. What questions um, do you guys have for me? It's no longer an ology, so I haven't had a child in a long time, but is a booster seat? Ah, so technically it's M. A car seat is really truly defined as anything that's restraining the child in a vehicle to keep them safe. A booster seat is technically considered that. So yes, your eight-year-olds, well, about to turn eight, your seven-year-olds, uh, can be sitting in a booster seat with no problem. If they put an infant in a booster seat, I'd probably be a little bit more concerned about that. But yes, an infant, or excuse me, a booster seat is considered a car seat. And every car seat, there's actually a lot of challenges with car seats in the sense that every manufacturer of every car seat uh, has different rules and regulations and stipulations for weights and lengths and heights and what can be rear facing for how long, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually quite complex. Uh, I don't expect you guys to understand those great details. It actually should be the families that are trying to look into that to know what they purchased. Um, so it's not your responsibility to make sure they set it up in their vehicle right. They're not, it's not your responsibility to do a lot of those pieces for the older pediatric population. That's the family's responsibility. Okay. A question back there. So the, the ED house code team that's supposed to be coming in support of a code blue, are these people that have additional training? Good question. Good question. So um, in the last year or so, we've been trying to pull up a little bit more robust for the ED team. So the ED team essentially has always been per policy, the person that would be responding to a pediatric code blue. Um, they have been getting some more robust training. Um, not They've done a little bit, but we don't have any kind of a dedicated code team like PEDS uh, or PEDS code team education like we do with the adult code team. So for the adult code team, there's a specific group of people, a specific team, specifically every single time they work, that's what their role is. And they have a lot of training associated with that. Unfortunately, that's not the case with our pediatric code blue team, um, but it's something we're hoping to strive for to continue to provide more education, more uh, training with equipment, essentially doing more mock codes. Um, and we actually are gonna start doing four mock codes at each campus and each location. So we will be able to have start having a lot more practice with these. So that being said, they are all PALS trained. All of the providers are getting special education on how to lead codes a little bit with their provider team. And we're continuing to make their team a little bit more robust in, in responding to codes. Um, it's actually been found as a gap that we were um, not really focusing a lot of attention on that. And as I've started to work with the population a little bit more, I'm really realizing how big that gap is. And we're trying to help provide a lot more support and a lot more education to all the areas that do see PEDS. Um, so they can feel a little more confident and prepared in a code. And we're trying to do that for the burn unit. I'd like to provide that service for you guys a little bit more moving forward also, because I don't know many areas that feel very confident and comfortable in a pediatric coding situation. I, I actually don't feel anyone feels that way. And we don't get enough of them to ever become competent in a sense that we feel confident. Okay, so we just don't have enough exposure, which I think we're all a little pleased by, but it's that high risk situation in, a, in something that we see very low volume of. So we wanna continue to provide that education and support. 
Did that help answer your question back there? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you give us any tips on like for infants and children, like the best IV access places? Oh, good. Okay, so um, definitely the AC of a child is usually the best. Unfortunately, if you blow that one, that sucks because it's the hard. It's like the best one you had. So uh, it's kind of that catch-22. The ACs are usually almost always the best location to get a good one. Um, but again, it's that idea that if you blow that one, it kind of limits you. So what I usually like to recommend to people when they're trying to do IVs is to start low and then go up. So if they're going for the hand, start at the hand. If you don't find one there, you can go towards the arm. Essentially then if you get to the AC, you get to the AC. Uh, don't be so scared of the feet. I know people are very scared of feet. It doesn't seem natural nor normal, but you can definitely do a foot of a baby. It's actually a good place to get a IV for a baby. And you can even get in the uh, saphenous a little bit too, because essentially they're not usually um, walking in any way. So especially the babies, the, lo the young babies. So a lot of times the feet are actually a good place to get a good IV. And essentially they're not pulling it. They're not ripping it because a lot of times they can kick a little. But a lot of times it's a good way to have one that lasts longer. Um, so those are kind of my tips for you. I know we don't do them all that often if you're not seeing peds patients frequently. Um, sometimes the NICU can come and assist to help occasionally too when we have a really hard um, stick on some patients and we have some great pick nurses that are specific to babies too. So if or when you've tried a lot of times and you guys are completely out of resources, they can be a resource sometimes for that. Did that help answer? Mm -hmm. Okay. They're a challenge no matter what, I'm gonna tell you that. Even when you've done a lot of kids and a lot of IVs, when they're kicking, they're screaming, and that two-year-old is the fighter, you're still gonna have struggles. It's a challenge. Any other questions for me?